I've always been square with everything because that's how I was taught in from wrestling to basketball to football. You keep everything square so you don't create any muscle imbalances. So I look at weightlifting just like I look at basketball. So weightlifting, if you look at my exact start, which is square, everything forward, that's the same position I would jump in. So that's my most explosive position. And that's why I always, a lot of people, they look at weightlifting and they just separate it from sports. Well, this is why people do Olympic weightlifting, to be more explosive, functional. Functional is the major word there. Welcome to Barbell Strong. I'm Mike Bledsoe here with Doug Larson and D. Kenny Kane. We're at Venice Barbell Club in Venice Beach. And uh, yeah, we're hanging out with Derek Johnson. And yeah, yeah. Uh, what's really special about Derek, well, there's a lot of things special about Derek. We sat down at lunch with him, but I found out that he's uh, not only an international athlete, but an international coach, level five USAW coach. That's uh, very impressive because to get to that point, you actually have to produce athletes to get there. It's not like, oh, I just went to the seminars and I took the test, I did so good. You know, you, don't have, you actually have to demonstrate that you can produce athletes over time, which is really, really impressive. Yeah. yeah. yeah another interesting thing that we talked about this morning that I think our, our audience would love to hear about is are your thoughts on training environment? Like what makes a really good training environment? What makes like kind of a shitty training environment? Like, like where do you need to be? What's the environment you need to be like if you want to be a world-class athlete and have a really good training session? And one of the things, D, I'm really interested in, and we've talked before, I've had the luxury of uh, interviewing once before, and one of the things that we didn't get to is the role of ego and the role of swag. Mm -hmm. And I want to kind of jump into that, knowing you and getting in there a little bit more deeply. Yeah. So it's 2017, and a big complaint in American weightlifting is that we're not recruiting athletes early enough. You know, it's like, oh, we're not, you know, a lot of other countries are getting athletes and, you know, when they're, and they're before they're, they're preteens, right? And so you got into weightlifting really early and you've also created programs for recruiting uh, the youth into the sport. So can you tell us about how you got into it and the programs you've created? Well, I started at uh, Olympic style weightlifting 20 years ago at the age of 12 years old. So I was at this after school program in the inner city. It was just like a program to try to keep kids off the streets just to give us something to do. In the gym, you had basketball, you had kids lifting weights on the platform. I didn't know what the lifts were. I didn't know what a snatch was, a clean, a clean and jerk, like any of that stuff was. But I'm a guy that played basketball, so with the hoop being in there, that was, that was all I needed. And so after that, I was like, you know what? I could get bigger, get, get stronger. Well, here we go. I'm, I'm about to start competing in whatever this sport was. And also another thing with the program I started at, it was the only program of its kind in the United States. So it was just all, it was just pretty much all black kids in there. Yeah. They were all come from poverty. This is Live for Life. So this, this is Live for Life gym yeah. in St. Louis. Mm. And it was started in 1988, and I first came there in 1997. And so I began the coaching there at 19 in uh, 2004. And my ideal age of getting an athlete is eight years old seven years old. My brothers, who are twins, the Barnes brothers, they started at seven. Yeah, and so, they're damn good lifters. Yeah. yeah, and so with that, you can get the reps in. You can really develop the technique. When kids start later, let's say you start in eighth grade, it's kind of late for a sport because you, you're trying to go through all the development. The older you are when you start, the more you have to work on mobility. If I get someone at seven years old, eight years old, their mobility is perfect. There's nothing you need to really work on. All you need to do is just work on the technique at that point. Mm. But if you get them at 13, they might have been sitting around. Maybe they were active in sports. Maybe they weren't. So now you have to work on mobility. You get an 18-year-old, you have to work on even more. You get someone 25, you have to work on that much more. You have to reverse some yeah. of the, the, the bad movement patterns that they developed. Yeah. And one thing people don't really think about when they think about mobility, especially with, with what you're saying about starting sports at a really early age, is like if you're 25 and you try to get more, more range of motion, your shoulder, your hips, your ankles, or what have you, I mean, it, it's very doable. You can get more range of motion. But a lot of people think about like 
if I want more range of motion, I gotta make my muscles longer, quote unquote, or like I have soft tissue restrictions. And they, they don't think bones, they think just soft tissue structures. But if you start a sport when you're like four, five, six, seven, eight years old and you grow up doing that sport, it will actually affect your bone structure. Because some people can't get into a, a position because, not just because they have soft tissue restrictions, but because there's bony blocks. Like the, their bones aren't the right shape to achieve a certain position. So what you're saying like about starting super early and that, that prepping you for the sport is, is super important in my opinion, but a lot of people don't really consider it. Well, well imagine looking at gymnastics. Totally. If you start at gymnastics at That's five right. years old, you're too old. Find, mm -hmm. find another sport to do, you're too old, you need to be in gymnastics at three to four because there's so many reps you have to get in. Mm. Basketball players, most of us, like when you start playing basketball, you start at four, whenever you can mm -hmm. physically get the ball up there. That's when you start basketball. Pee wee football is a big thing. Mm -hmm. like, you, you have to start early. And that's some, that's some pretty good contact there with, with kids. But football, there's those reps you need to develop. Kids are already getting recruited by the time middle school happens. So that's the thing about the professional sports. Basketball players, you know what guys are. Basketball players in middle school are getting scholarships for high school. Mm -hmm. they already, these coaches are already on the, on the playgrounds, the basketball courts. They're, they're already at it. So if you're talking about building the sport of, of, of American weightlifting, you need to be getting after it. And so right now I'm developing an uh, after-school program, and it's going to be in the South Los Angeles area. Mm. And so the whole goal is, of course, I want kids 18 and under. I really want them 7, 8. And, and I'm not just going to wait for them to come for me. I'm going to be in the housing projects. I'm going to be at the recreation centers. I'm going, I'm going to, to recruit. And, and, I'm, and I'm thankful that USA Wisdom is, is uh, really excited about this, uh, this venture I'm on. And they're all about it. And they're, they're, they're ready. And they're, they're ready to help out. So you're, you're kind of trying to replicate what you got. Because you started when you were 12, right? I started when I was 12, yes. Yeah. yeah. And then this is a really unique opportunity. And, yeah. and very rare. I mean, what yeah. you described, like black kids going to Olympic weightlift yeah. is not something that yeah. you hear often in a sentence. No, no. So uh, I, I remember going to, to trips at, once again, we're, we're, we would show up at in like two bands, two light bands, and it would be 30 kids. 30 kids hopping out the band to go to these remote areas in Missouri and <laughs> Illinois and around the Midwest. And people would, like, sure. we were a sight Check to see. Check it up a little bit, Not man. that we were doing, yeah. we weren't doing anything. We were just kids. Yeah. But it was a sight to see where you, yeah. oh, yeah. don't, hey, let's stay away from them. So yeah. We were just kids trying to, trying to compete. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, like, one of the things that we had to adjust to. But, uh, so wait, real quick, before, before we dig too much into that story, for people that still don't really know who you are, like, like who are you in the world of weightlifting? Like, okay. what are your accomplishments? What, are, what have you done? Like, why should someone listen to you regarding weightlifting? <laughs> We haven't, got, we haven't gotten there yet. So that's a great question. So I've been competing for 20 years. Uh, once again, I started at the age of 12 years old. I'm the current American record holder uh, for the snatch and for the total uh, world team member. I won the national championships two months, two months ago. I've won six senior national titles, eight American Open titles now, junior national titles, collegiate world team member, junior world team member, youth world team member. Uh, so, so I made all those international teams. Uh, in 2014, I scored the most points for the United States at the World Championships in a qualifier in over 10 years. I'm also, as a coach, a level five senior international coach. So that's the highest level there. I became a level five coach at 27. So I, be, I was the youngest level five coach in USA history. The first African American level five in USA history. I'm the only coach uh, in the world to have three different world senior world team members from three different countries: United States, Canada, and Brazil. I have a guy that that has competed at two Olympics now, and so I'm, of course I'm the age of 32 now. And so even if you eliminated everything from an at, uh, athlete accomplishment, just okay. Let's look at let's look at the coaching. I uh, started coaching at 19 years old and I've coached hundreds of kids throughout the St. Louis area. At 24 years old, I created an uh, Olympic weightlifting program at a university, so it was the first of its kind. And not only was it, it, was, it, it wasn't a club sport, it was, it's actually an official sport, meaning that lifters there can get grants, can get scholarships, mm. we pay for memberships, entry fees, travel to competitions, meal stipends. And so that's what I created there at Lindenwood University. A lot of, a lot of that was getting created around the time that, that I discovered weightlifting. 
The 06, 07. Yeah. So, and so all this is before so, like, the social media book. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it was just because I have a, a passion in the sport and I feel like the sport was enabled me to see the world. Doug, does, I feel like that answers the question pretty damn well. <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot going on. You're, 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 you're easily one of the most like experienced, yeah. decorated weightlifters in the United States, like by far. Yeah. Like you are, you are a tip-top yeah. guy, which is why yeah. we're here hanging yeah. out and talking. Yeah. 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 Um, so you're not just an athlete, though, as you said. Like yeah. you're a super experienced coach, and I know just from hanging out with you this morning, like I can tell you're a natural coach. Like talking to us all day, like you're you're constantly coaching us. Like on on everything from from weightlifting, of course, to to nutrition, to to how to interact with your athletes, etc. So I'd love to hear more about your perspectives on coaching and like how do you deal with your athletes? Like how do you build somebody from a young age, you know, seven eight years old, and build them up to the ranks so they can be you know superstar in high school, college, and beyond? Well, just when I'm looking at athletes, and I was talking to you earlier, and I try to keep like saying things so I can expose people to things. Because when I was learning about nutrition or learning about corrective exercises or movement prep, it was only because the idea was sprinkled into my head. And once the idea was there, I was able to look into it further. And, and so when I'm looking at, when I'm coaching someone one-on-one, -on -one, and let's say we had a good week of training and the next week they, they, they're kind of sore. So now my question as a coach now would be to roll out or foam roll, mm. what have you eaten the past few days? because something you ate three days ago could be the reason why you're inflamed in a particular area today. So now we can start, hey, write it down or, or, or just tell me out loud. So now we can start making an adjustment and now you can start the healing process because I believe healing is done through food and not through chemicals. Mm. So I want everything to be natural as possible. So at the same time you're uh, switching how you eat and reducing the inflammation in the food you eat, you're recovering for training and getting better for the next day. Wait, when you, when you say healing's done through food but not done through chemicals, what, what does that mean? So, uh, a lot of times, when at, especially with athletes, so by the age of 17 years old, I was taking Vicodin, 800 milligrams of ibuprofen each, each day before training. <laughs> mm. I was taking muscle relaxers if I needed that after training. I was taking more Vicodin after the workout if I needed that. Mm. Of course, that, every chemical has a, has a reaction. Every single chemical. Yeah. Whatever prescription pill, whatever over-the-counter, uh, medicine that you possibly want to take, there are a, a whole list of, of reactions. Well, we want to do natural things like turmeric, ginger, bone broth, uh, or eating foods that are lower in ant or inflammation. The typical American diet is inflammatory. The typical diet. Mm -hmm. So if I asked a, a normal person, just pulled them off the street, and they, list, they gave me a list of what they ate that, today, it would be inflammatory. Everything from Maybe it could have been, you had a lot of dairy in there. So dairy is high on the list. Grains are high on the list. Sugar, uh, legumes. So, so, so I, and, and I would start with things like that first. So I know, I, know if a person, I know if a person is eating those list of ingredients, they're gonna be inflammatory. That could be the reason that their, their hip is hurting on the squats. Because the inflammation, of course, is created in the gut. Well, that tightens up the hip, tightens up the hamstrings. So there's a lot of things going on once inflammation is, 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 is present in the body. And so now we reduce that, now I can get more results out of, my, out of the athlete I'm talking about. So if I get somebody younger that's avoiding all the inflammation, seven, eight years old, mm. so you mean to tell me they're not gonna be running into those issues because all injuries happen around the joints. Inflammation is stored around the joints. So we can reduce the rate of injuries by reducing inflammation and so that's if I was working with a seven-year-old an eight-year-old or a 30-year-old 70-year-old these are the same conversations I have and this is a part of my Olympic weightlifting coaching mm. this is not me just randomly bringing up gut health or the gut microbiome uh, yeah you're not just coaching the athlete on technique you're yeah, coaching the athlete yeah. on, no, no. on all aspects of yeah, the sport on all, as all aspects of life and then from that point, after I talk about nutrition, then I'll talk about corrective exercises. I'll talk about movement prep. So, which is, uh, I'll, I'll do 10 minutes of corrective exercises before I train. Mm. So it's no stretching, no yeah. foam rolling. It's all activation, loosening up the joints, getting the body ready for movement. You know, it's funny, you're 32, and by some measure, 32 years old, and Olympic lifting can be considered uh, starting to enter the dinosaur realm. And, <laughs> Um, based on your energy and our brief conversations recently, it doesn't seem like you're 
feeling like a 32 year old that's been lifting for 20 years. And I'm assuming that a lot of it is because of the way that you're yeah. handling this stuff for yourself. Yeah. Well, and it's funny. I remember when I first moved to Los Angeles almost five years ago, I was just moving here to coach. I had competed for 15 years and I was, I've had so many cortisone injections throughout from 18 to 26. They're I've delicious, had, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it so was, tasty. That's, that's it was a, a normal part. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was the part I forgot to add when I, when I brought in the painkillers, the muscle relaxers, the, the, the ibuprofen. Yep. I, I have to mention cortisone, cortisone injections, mm -hmm. which is over time not the best thing for, for the tendons and mm -hmm. all that. It, I've had them in my back. I've had them in both knees. Yeah. We have, so we have many two times. knee surgeries, right? So I've had two knee surgeries. I've spent so many hours getting MRIs to where it was just like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to move to Los Angeles. I'm starting over. Uh, I'm just going to coach. And it was mm. because I was exposed to these, these different ideas. It was just like, when I heard about the elimination style diet, it was just like, it just doesn't make sense. You know, so, you're, so you're saying if I eliminate these things from my diet, my knee that always swells that I've had the medial, the lateral, the lateral and the medial meniscus torn mm. multiple times. You tell me if I eliminate these things, that, that inflammation, that swelling that I, just a normal part of my life is going to be gone? Nah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a competitor though. So now I'm researching these things. It just doesn't make, you know, everybody's talking about nutrition. Mm -hmm. Everybody's a dietitian, mm -hmm. sure. especially in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what they're talking about. I noticed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 like everybody's an expert. <laughs> and so now, of course, I'm the guy that just loves research in, in general. Just whatever I'm, whatever I'm interested in, mm -hmm. I'll spend the day doing it. I'll read the book on it. I'll YouTube video after YouTube video from politics to my Lakers to gut health <laughs> to movement prep. Uh, so at, at this point, before I, and it's still, I'm still not switching yet. I'm still eating fast food here. This is five years ago, less than five years ago. I'm still eating fast food. I'm still going, eating my regular, regular way I've learned how to eat in St. Louis. The processed foods, uh, I'm doing movement prep at this time. So I've already, I've eliminated sit-ups and crunches because I came across this idea of this guy called Stuart McGill. And Stuart <laughs> McGill is a big proponent of eliminating sit-ups, crunches, Russian twists, leg raises, anything that isolates mm -hmm. muscles in, in the core. Mm -hmm. Because the core is defined as the shoulder joint to the hip joint. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to isolate any muscle group in the stomach. So now I'm feeling a little better. I'm able to squat without a belt on because my back, I've had so many cortisones in there. I've taken so many sedatives and muscle relaxers for the back. So, so I'm, I'm moving a little better. But now this gut health or this elimination style diet thing is, is saying that my joints could feel better. Mm. So I say, you know what? After this Super Bowl, I think it was like February 6, 2013, I'm trying. And so at that point, and I was not going to compete again, but I was feeling so much better. I remember call, uh, talking to my mother a week later after I tried it, and I lost close to 10 pounds. I was in a heavier weight class when I was competing. Damn. So I was probably, when I moved to Los Angeles, I was probably 160 almost. Yeah. I competed in a 136.6 pound weight class. Of course, I do a weight cut, but I'm in the 62 kilogram weight class. And so, and, and I remember the people saying like, okay, when you do this, you'll probably lose five, 10 pounds. <laughs> how's, a, how's a guy going that 6% right. body fat already? Right. Right. I was yeah. already, like yeah. I've, already, I've always yeah. loved the look yeah. of, of muscles and being lean there. Uh, how's a guy that's 6% and that's, I was probably more, probably five, mm -hmm. but how am I gonna lose 10 pounds? It's not possible. Where's it gonna come from? In five <laughs> yeah. days, I was, so, I was so light yeah. that at this point, I think I could compete. And I was talking to my mother, I was like, I haven't felt like this since I've been like 15 years old. Because the knee issue started, of course, mm. at 16, 17. Back issue, 16, 17. Yeah. Which, of course, creates the condition of me taking painkillers to get through all the sports I was taking. Uh, and of course, I would have my first knee surgery at 19, 20. So, 
Real quick, we, we heard what you decided that you weren't going to eat anymore, all, all the pro-inflammatory foods yeah. that, you, that you had mentioned. Um, what, what did your diet, what did your diet look like when you lost all the weight, and what does it look like now? Like, what does yeah. the normal day look so, like? So actually, it's pretty, it's pretty similar to, to what it was then. Uh, I would go to red meat. I would go to the like higher fat, low carbs, which also scared me. Mm. So the, once you brought up the word keto, I remember a person that was telling me, I was like, because eh, once again, I was researching. And mm. keto, depending on who you search for online, can give you some results that you don't want to know about keto. Mm. A lot of propaganda out here. But uh, so I started looking into keto, and I came back and I asked the guy I was training in Santa Monica at the time. Uh, and so I was like, so you like red meat, like, like high fat and low carbs? I was like, keto? Then I was like, and then he was like, He's like, yeah, what's the problem with that? And I didn't expect him to just say that. I didn't expect him to be like, oh, like make some long excuse to like make me comfortable, I, I guess. So anyway, so red meats, uh, low carbs, and I mean low carbs like nuts every here and there, mm. green vegetables. So the, the, the vegetables need to be green. Uh, avocado is my only fruit. Mm. And so that's a big part. I know a lot of people do like the fruit, the, the juices, but my number one thing is inflammation and, and keeping the blood sugar down. Mm -hmm. So I go off fat, so I'm pretty much like this all day. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people that do the mm -hmm. blood, uh, I'm sorry, the, the carbs, uh, or even the, the fruit, mm -hmm. still is gonna break down the same way and, and create inflammation at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So all of it get, gets broken down the same way, whether you're eating an apple, a slice of, of wheat bread, Still, still breaking down the same way. So how many, how many grams of carbs are you eating in a day? Uh, I guess whatever two avocados is, whatever a little spinach mm -hmm. is. So not much. Not I mean, much. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, so like I'm a lunch, to make sure I'm keto. Like a lunch hey. today, you had like a burger patty. Yeah. You, had, you had a bunch of lettuce, leafy avocado. greens. You had some avocado. Yeah. Like everything you're talking about, you ate a lunch today. Yeah. So you're, and so and you're, not making, you're not making this shit up. Yeah, and, so, so, <laughs> right. and, and, and everything's about fueling the body. And, yeah. and once again, so if we look at every single, like, so something like, like fruit, uh, processed foods, grains, sugars, like mm. that's going to create a blood sugar spike. Mm. So now that, that. Did you, did you go through a period of time where you didn't feel well? Because I heard about this keto flu thing. Uh, it was more like the first like three days. I mean, you couldn't yeah. talk to me. It was like my right. body was like, where is that stuff at that you've been feeding it for 27, 28 years now? It's like, where is it? And then it was just like, and then like, as you kept feeding it fat, the body was able to switch over. So it's like, once you get through those initial like three days, two, three days maybe, I don't know, five for some, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so you started feeling better. And yeah. you go, well, fuck it, I'm gonna compete. Right. And, and so and you so, started, you started well, So I hadn't competed nationally in, in like a year and a half. Yeah. Or, or going into the uh, national championships in 2013, I hadn't competed in a year and a half nationally. And so at that point, it's like, you know what? Let's start, let's start making YouTube videos, show my progress. Hey, I'm coming as a 62. I called up a, a person I knew in this, or I, I messaged a, a person I knew in the sport for a long time, uh, Ursula, who's my coach, Pop Andrea. And so and she's also a senior international coach. She used to lift in the, in the 90s. And so she's been in, in the sport of Olympic weightlifting for, I don't know, over 30 years. She's the current president of USA Weightlifting. She's also the vice president of the International Weightlifting Federation. So she's on fire this year. And so, but, but she, she wasn't any of those things at, at, in 2013. It was just a coach that I've seen absolutely put in the work. And I messaged her, I was like, you know what, I'm thinking about competing again. Will you be my coach? And then she was like, yes. Also, I'm thinking about competing in the lighter weight class. She was like, let's go. I think it's really interesting to note that like, you're a super accomplished athlete. You have lots of coaching experience. Like, you are fully capable, if you wanted to, to write your own programming and to, and to manage yourself as an athlete. But for a lot of people out there that like, they want to write their own programs yeah. and they don't want to get a coach, they think they can do it themselves. Like, yeah. You're like, as experienced as you get, and you still decide to get a coach. Like, why, why is well, that? Well, I was actually writing my, my workouts for about a decade mm -hmm. because I was, I, would have, I was coaching so many people that I would do the workouts that they were doing. Mm -hmm. Since I'm the coach, of course, yeah. I, I wrote yeah. it. Uh, but it's about building that support system. So in, in sports, you have to have that support system. And so she's gonna be my ride or die at the competitions, 
cutting weight. Mm-hmm. Like I, I've had competition where I cut close to eight pounds on the day of. My best comp, like one of my favorite, mem- like favorite competitions. Remember, I, bro- I think I broke the American record three, four, five times in, in one competition. I was, like breaking my own record at that point. But it was that day I cut 7.7 pounds. And her weight cutting, and I didn't know, I wasn't like a weight cutter like that. But she has, once again, she's been in the sport for so long, she's going through the process of cutting weight. She's been at these international weightlifting competitions. It, and who better to have it? And it wasn't based off her being a woman or a man, but based off her bio or her accomplishments. Because a lot of times I get the question and I'll say, oh yeah. And people ask me about my coach and I'll say, oh yeah, she's blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I was, what'd you say? You said, did you say her, she? And most of the time it's, it's women that usually like ask it two, two or three times. Hold on, your coach, your coach is a woman. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we found out about your training, your diet, and, and, all, and your approach with uh, youth weightlifting. And I'll, let's take a break. When we come back, I want to get into the ego question. Mm. And we're back with Derek Johnson, probably the most accomplished athlete slash coach I've ever met. Somebody who, who's done it, who's done both athlete and coaching to that degree. Really, really impressive. In the first half, we covered what you do for your diet, how you got into weightlifting, youth programs for weightlifting. And now we want to dig into, uh, what are we digging into, Kenny? Well, I think one of the big things we want to dive into is the role of ego and the role of swag. For you personally, in coaching, and just the sport of Olympic weightlifting. Well, just how I see like ego and swag. Like ego is something that every athlete needs. Like you, if you don't have any ego, you better go find some. But it's all about having respect. You're somebody who's arrogant, it has a big ego where you're gonna rub some people the wrong way. But my thing is always respect. I would never do anything to disrespect someone's platform, disrespect someone's environment. Uh, swag, like when you know that you put in all the work. You can, like you'll see me uh, sometimes when I'm in between the sets, I'm in here dancing, I'm, in, I'm feeling good because I, I, I feel like I'm putting in all the work. I'll sometimes, let's say if I'm getting ready for a workout, once again I've been doing this for 20 years, two knee surgeries, Sometimes I'll come in and I might, I might do a, the norm attack for 20, 30 minutes. I might do stem. I might, there's been times where I do uh, Epsom salt baths, ice baths. I might go see, go get laser therapy. I might go see another chiropractor. So these all, all these things I would do if I was like sore and this is a back to back. Let's say it's Monday and I have to come in here Tuesday and I'm just sore. There's no way I need to work out. Oh, I'm working out. There's no way I'm not, oh. <laughs> I'm going to be on that platform, and I'm doing the percentages that, that, the, that the coach put on there. Because I'm, I'm going to, if, if I have come in here and work out at 10 a.m., I'm going to be up at 7 a.m. starting the process of getting ready for the workout. And so now I know when, I don't know how I was able to squat today, but I'm in here snatching, hitting the deepest bottom position, and now I'm in here dancing between the workout, feeling fantastic. But that's also just helping out the, the, the environment. And that, that's the swag factor. That's the ego factor. But it also has to be respectful of anybody you're around, though. Yeah. And you just mentioned environment. And at the beginning of the show, I was wanting to hear more about like, what makes a good training environment. So can you expand on that? Like, what makes a good training environment so yeah. someone can train in an optimal setting? Yeah. And, and, and with me, I've, I've trained around a lot of guys. I've trained around multiple guys that have been at the Olympics, senior world team. None of that matters. That's cool. It doesn't matter if you've just begun the, the, the process or training in the Olympic weightlifting. As long as you're having a, a great time, you're bringing the energy, turn it up. Give me loud music and somebody that's ready to work. It doesn't matter if you've been doing it for six months or 16 years. Like, that's, that's the atmosphere to me. Like, just music that we all, that, that most of us like or enjoy. <laughs> you're not gonna get music that everybody loves. Everybody, no. But <laughs> some, some songs here and there, and, and, and that's, that's the environment. That, that I want, because I, because I'm going to bring it. I'm going to be in here grunting and yelling and dancing when when that's when my song comes on. So uh, just making it enjoyable, making it fun. And so that's the optimal setting. But if you have people in there, and, and I'm and I've seen some situations where it's, you got somebody constantly missing lifts, getting upset, throwing weights, crying. That's a poison atmosphere. That's poison. 
There's no crime. Because, now, there's no because, crime. Because, because Olympic you see, lifting. Kind of, when you see that, <laughs> you're just like, I gotta be back. This per now, if you even had that thought in your head, that's not a good environment. And so this morning when I was training with you guys, we, the music was up, the platforms, it was like 10 platforms in here, all the platforms filled, the weights were hitting the floor, everybody was just, just working on their positions, getting better, and, and to me that's what an a, a atmosphere is, that's what I've always tried to create in, in all my 20 years. I was that guy at, at Live for Life when I walked in there at 12 years old, like, oh, all these guys are bigger than me? <laughs> I'm about to get them all. Not saying that, but that's, that's what I'm thinking, going back to the, the ego. Yeah. Like, you better start thinking it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people can't even say something out loud. So you, oh, you, you're yeah. probably not gonna. Well, yeah, back to what you were saying earlier about like, you gotta have the ego if yeah. you wanna be the best. Like, yeah. if you wanna be the best, you gotta yeah. believe that you're the best. And you gotta have an ego to do that, but you still can be respectful without yeah. like, telling everyone else that you fucking suck and I'm awesome. Yeah. And then everyone doesn't know me like you anymore. Yeah. But, well, that's but on, the, on the platform, you gotta believe you're the best. Right. And that's just that's, that's not allowed. That creates a, a terrible atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Even someone like me that's a, a world team member, I would never say any of those, those things to people. Mm -hmm. To make the atmosphere better, I would say, hey, you should, hey, test this position out. Hey, you, yo, your hip is tight. You doing any glute work today? So I'm, I'm trying to make adjustments with the people. So I'm always having, even though, of course, I've seen me as a weightlifter athlete first, my number one conversation is around gyms or gut health because I'm trying to reduce the inflammation that the person can move more. Less inflammation, more range of motion. So there, there's all these things that, that I'm trying to do to like, better the, the environment. Because if everybody's better around me, I'm better. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so even when I was, so I started coaching, even though I was at a national championship level already, you know what, if I bring all these guys up, this atmosphere is going to be better. Mm -hmm. Even with my younger brothers being nine years younger than me, they got to the point where they were 14 and they were, they were, they were coming on Saturdays and train with the older guys. We had a great atmosphere. And now, you know what? It's like, so at 24, I created the, the, the college program. We had a great atmosphere. We had guys from Brazil, Canada, Ukraine, and of course, all throughout the United States. So they, we were creating, that was a really nice atmosphere there. Yeah. One thing that I noticed is you never stopped coaching. I get, like you, you are a natural coach. When I walked in, you were coaching yeah. subtly, and you you slide it in, and we're having like you were saying before, yeah. we're we're having lunch. You're just that's your nature and who you are, and I, I find yeah. that to be really really interesting. Okay, because I I guess that's why I started coaching because I'm passionate about the sport, and I think that I have the the mindset to be patient with someone. So imagine when you, when you're coaching that, because I would coach like so many eight year olds the eight-year-old boys or the eight-year-old girls, imagine them laying on the platform and you never, you, and you always stay impatient. And so you're like, okay, well, we're gonna get it. We're gonna roll, she's playing, they're doing this and doing that. We have kids running all around the place. Okay, okay, let's get, get back over here. Let's, let, let's keep working on it. Really, hey, focus now. But, but, but even stuff like that, and I, and I know I always had the patience to coach. Because of course you're dealing with all different types of personalities, I mean, you're, it's a, it's a psycho-emotional job. Yeah. You basically, like, because it goes well beyond teaching someone a movement. Being, being an instructor is one thing, but being yeah. someone who goes, oh, I can tell where they're at. Yeah. I can tell what they may be thinking yeah. or feeling, and I know exactly what to say or even the body language to use in order to, to communicate with that person. Yeah. And I, I find that to be, you're especially good at that. Yeah. So well, that, and, and, and it's funny, so I'm, point a, that out. I'm a political science major. There you go. And so, the program that I started at was, of course, an after school inner city program. And so most of us came from single family households, came from violent neighborhoods. So for me, I'm, I'm one of seven kids. Are you, are you the oldest? Uh, I have an older sister that's about six years older than I am. But I was the first male, I was the first of the family to start lifting, and all the rest. Oh, you used to take under. care of kids and watch yeah, yeah, them. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you, I would watch my younger brothers a lot. So I was all around, yeah, I was always around kids. And so now at the program that I was started coaching at, that I started lifting at at 12, my brothers would be a part of that program. And so uh, it would be, I'm sorry, I would have a sister under me, a, a brother under me, another brother, and then the twins. Yeah. So it was Even six of us that lifted. Do you know all of them won like uh, national championships in their age groups? All of them. And, and so, 
and and I saw the rest of the kids it's, it's like brothers. But, yeah. but going back to that political science thing, it was like this is the way I can impact the community. Yeah. This uh, this like from the people that I consider heroes, they impacted their community in, in a certain way. Oh, I can, I can do it this way through weightlifting. Weightlifting was just like my 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 route to impacting the community from like my story raising millions of dollars for that program to me doing fun like being at all the fundraisers the charity events mm -hmm. so any any donor board member that came through you came and you learned my story whether I was a as a coach lifter young kid throughout the whole entire process when the news media came it was always I would be the one because I would I took it as serious as as you can take any sport yeah. because once again I was a guy that would or I, I was the guy that I would dive in volleyball, like I, whatever, kickball. Come on, man, you, you, come, we can do better than this. We can beat this man. team. And so I just had that competitive drive always. And, at, and when I started coaching at 19, it wasn't about winning anything. Like my win was going to be ju judged based off us, uh, uh, judged based off the kids graduating from high school. Yeah. Because in that St. Louis area, you got a uh, graduation rate, especially for black males, probably less than 50%. Yeah. And so now at this point, okay, I've graduated high school. I'm I'm attending college now. I'm changing. I'm I'm changing like my whole structure here because my mother had seven kids and only three of us graduated high school. So these are the conditions I'm from. The the neighborhood I was from was nothing but gangs. So you had to be from my neighborhood to even be able to walk in the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was just. Uh, I remember just like the, my fourth grade year, my house was shot, shot up in a drive-by. Uh, a lot of friends got, got killed this particular year. This was just, it's like, okay, I'm, what am I, 19 years old? Okay, this is, this is life. This, this is how I thought all Americans were living. I didn't know it was just certain, certain people living this particular way. And so it was just like, this is the daily thing you see on the, on the daily basis. Uh, and then even going to Live for Life gym. So now you got, I'm from the south side. The gym is, 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 is located on the north side. Um, south side and north side, people kind of have a, we're, we're kind of not on friendly terms because it, it, this is the ghetto. So everybody's in desperation mode and every, you're trying to be that one to make it out the ghetto. Yeah. And, and so, so in my neighborhood, I'm kind of safer than what I am at the gym because now at the gym you have People from the north side, people from the west side, people from the south side. You have bloods, you have crips. In the gym, though. In the gym. In, in, so the in, gym is more dangerous than the neighborhood that I live, the, the, the street that I live on, even though the murder rate is high on the street that I live on. I'm sorry, not the street, but the, the zip area that I live in. Mm. So because there's, you pretty much know the people in the neighborhood, or somebody knows somebody in the neighborhood, but at the gym, Blood doesn't get along with the crib, mm -hmm. the and then the, and then it's kind of like everything is like divided. The south side, person, not that I, have, I don't have an issue with anybody, but the south side person, since we we were further so, away from the gym, you were at more danger because you were less in numbers. Mm -hmm. So the north side people had bigger numbers, and the gym was actually surrounded by one of the biggest housing projects at the time, and then more housing projects. So we're at like the poverty rate is incredibly high with, with the kids that attend, that attend the gym. And so you, you got the, you got strong, you got tough. It was, it was like almost either or. And so fights every day, fights every day in the gym. Like so sometimes- Coach trying to help kids. Yeah. No, 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 this, like like, this is when I was a kid. Yeah. So it was, yeah. it was fights every day and it was just like, you would be on the platform, you couldn't, your, your back couldn't be toward people. You had to face the people while you were lifting because you didn't want somebody to, to run up on you or, or, or do anything to you. So this is, and, and so. You better be fast right. under the bar. Right. And, 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 so, and, and so I like basketball. I like weightlifting. <laughs> Nothing's stopping me from that. Yeah. Yeah. Come, come on with it. Yeah. Come on with it. Uh, I, got a, I got a question, change directions real quick. I got a question about your lifting style. So. So like when I watch you lift, like you don't have like a in all the ways that you could have a prototypical weightlifter body type. Like you're obviously super muscular, you're, you're relatively short, you're super fast, etc. But like you have a relatively short torso compared to your leg length, which yeah. if, if you were to stereotype a good weightlifting um, body type anthropometrically, you would have a long torso and short legs, yeah. right? So 
a lot of guys with short torsos, they tend to widen their stance a little bit, they tend to toe out a little bit, and that makes it where they can be a little more vertical, but, but I, I see that you don't do that. You, you do feet straight ahead, you're, you're relatively yeah. narrow stance, like you, they're not hard and fast rules, so you have to do those things, but, but a lot of people choose to do them, and, and I see that you currently don't. So the question is, like, how has your, um, like your setup, how, the way you approach the bar, the way you lift, how has that changed over time? Like, what have you tried, and what have you kind of settled on, and why? Uh, I've always been an athlete. So I've always tried to do like things functionally, and especially knowing the body and having injuries. I've always been square with everything because that's how I was taught. And from wrestling to basketball to football, you keep everything square so you don't create any muscle imbalances. So I look at weightlifting just like I look at basketball. So weightlifting, if you look at my exact start, which is square, everything forward, that's the same position I would jump in. So that's my most explosive position. And that's why I always, a lot of people, they look at weightlifting and they just separate it from sports. Well, this is why people do Olympic weightlifting, to be more explosive, functional. Functional is the major word there. So if you look at, so if you look at my stance, everything is square as if, I'm a, if I was jumping because that's my most explosive position. So why wouldn't I start my snatch or my clean jerk in my most explosive position? And if I were like coming off a of box jump and if I were landing, that's exactly where I catch the snatch at. That's exactly where I, I back squat at. Mm -hmm. So it's functional to all of my movements. And so yeah. when, I'm, when I do my seminars and I'm asked a similar question uh, that, that you pose there, yeah. this is how I answer it. I keep it like sports, yeah. exactly like sports. And, and so, so you know, actually, when I'm looking at someone turn their feet, and I'm looking at- do, a, you want, a, do you want to demo some of yeah, this while we're talking? Yeah, and, and, and so, 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 let's say, so, so let's say I was jumping. And I would jump here. And let's say I came and I, and I jumped and I landed. Okay. So let's look at my clean. This is exactly where I jump. This is my most balanced, most functional, most explosive position. And I catch the clean. This is exactly where I land. Exactly where I would land on that jump. Yeah. Because I'm not creating any muscle imbalances. So imagine if I'm, if I'm doing uh, like a toes out position, I'm creating a muscle imbalance. Mm -hmm. Once I create a muscle imbalance, a muscle imbalance, I'm going to start to compensate. So the same reason you're in basketball and the coach, if you come in the basketball practice like this on day one, push you over. You're going to push over because yeah. you're not as balanced. But the next thing when you're, when you're sliding laterally, you're at more rate. You're, you're at a higher rate for injury yeah. because your muscles are not balanced. Now you're causing one group to do more work and one group to do less. Yeah. And so now we're building a bad motor, motor pattern. And so that's how I look at things in 2017, 2018 as a coach. These are the things I'm trying to learn. I'm really trying to be functional. Going back to sit-ups, as, as I was saying earlier, functional. I don't want to train one muscle group. I don't want to create an uh, uh, imbalance. I want to train the entire core, the shoulder joint to the hip joint. That's functional movement. Me lifting with my toes forward, neutral, square, whatever you want to call it, that's functional. I'm lifting completely balanced here. Every muscle is working how it should work. And so I believe that's definitely like even making those like adjustments like that and really watching, really uh, I'll, I'll watch videos, a lot, especially the heavier lifts, I'll watch a lot to really make sure I'm not doing anything. I'm watching for any, any shifts. Why am I shifting? Why, why am I doing this? Why, why is that? Yeah. So these are the things that I need to work on. You watch a lot of slow-mo video of yourself lifting? I don't watch too much slow-mo now, but I'll just, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll post something, or I don't post it, and I just watch it. And then every time you watch it, you see something different. You, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, I, I know what I can do for that. Yeah. Or, I, or let me find out what I can do for that. Right. Yeah. Why, do you, do you, do you why, that I'm not getting enough ankle dorsiflexion. Just, oh, let me work more on, on that. Yeah, yeah. What's your, when you see that, when you see that there's a micro flaw in your technique, are you like, emotionally are you aggravated or you're like more like a scientist like i need to go fix that more like a scientist because mm. it's more like so this is the process when i walk yeah like winning is a process right you're gonna fail a lot to win yeah let's so, go fix it right so fix it. Go fix handle it. it so it's like i i kind of fixed clean and i was kind of I, I needed more i needed more ankle dorsiflexion on that I'm, I'm too far back in my hips and now i'm putting more load on my lumbar spine so everything for me is about protecting the joints. If I'm stable in every joint, mobile in every joint, now I can build strength. So I have to have those things first. And so when working with somebody that's younger, that's the foundation I start with, stability, mobility, and then strength. Yep.
Yeah, so uh, being a coach in 2017 and, and what we were talking about, you've covered nutrition, you're talking about having, looking at the, the joint by joint type of approach to movement. Um, and then we were also talking about core earlier. Um, how do you, how, I think most weightlifting coaches are, they just say, hey, do some core yeah. or it's do some sit ups or it's not very well rounded. Yeah. What are some specific things that you prescribe to athletes for core? So, uh, once again, going back to the work of, of Professor, Stuart, Professor Stuart McGill, he's the, the world's leading spine biomechanic. So when you get into your worst accidents, your worst athletic injuries, and you've seen doctor after doctor and they can't do anything, this is the guy you go see. And he goes back to rebuilding that movement pattern. And especially working through the core because everything is, is through the core. The transference of power from the lower half to the upper half is through the core. If I want to squat more, you know what? If I do more core work, I could get a bigger squat. And so I, I put that on my social media a lot of times. If you increase core strength, I increase overall strength. Or even saying something like, if I increase gut health, I can get stronger at lifting. Yeah. What is he? What? Mm -hmm. uh, and you're defining core. Right. I want to so, core, I to so, so core is, is functional core. Um, I could be talking about anything from a, a, a bird dog, a dead bug, a bear crawls, animal movements, baby patterns. If you're not familiar with DNS, look at a lot of the exercises that DNS put out there. Yeah. Uh, Craig Liebeson, uh chiropractor, but it's, it's functional movements. Research all these things. Stuart McGill, Craig Lee, DNS, and you'll see a lot of these functional movements. And as I mentioned in, in the beginning, eliminate sit-ups. Or do me a favor and read Dr. Stuart McGill's research. Yeah. And we were talking about earlier as well is um, if I'm programming for an athlete, I actually stop using the word warm-up. I don't say this is your warm-up and this is your workout. Yeah. You're doing the same thing. Right, right. You're just prescribing. So, this is like this is what you're doing today, period. Right. So when I'm working with people. I'll write the movement prep, which we can call warm up, or they're pretty much corrective exercises. Core work, glute work, and, and once again, the, the, the glute work could be bandit, band, monster walks, lateral walks. They could be diagonal sits, side bridges. Uh, so if somebody's not doing this, what are they risking? What, uh, or what, what, what are they leaving so, on the so table? So the great part, like even when warm ups were created decades ago, the, the, the idea was to reduce the rate of injury. Mm -hmm. So instead of you doing something cold, you would, you would reduce your rate of injury. The thing about with most warm ups, they're not activating anything. So the reason why I would prescribe core in there, if we activate the core, we can take load off the hips. If I activate the core, I can take load off the, off the lumbar or the low back. Yeah. I'm reducing the rate of injury. Uh, if I take load off my hips, my glutes can do more work. Mm -hmm. The glutes are the strongest thing in our lower body. They can take load off my knees, my quads. They can take load off my ankles. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people that can't control their, their feet, I instantly think they have tight hips. The core is connected to the hips. Or we can also do glute work, which could open up the hips and allow us to do more, which also takes load off the low back. I can open up my mid back, my T-spine or thoracic, whatever you want to refer to this area as, and now I can be more upright because most people are more here. And now they put more load on their shoulders, yep. more load on their elbows, mm -hmm. more load on their wrists, more load on their lumbar, mm -hmm. which is going to put more load on the hips. So just all type of bad movement patterns and, and compensation. So that's the that's why you would want to be doing movement pattern. I'm sorry, movement prep if you're not doing that. And I only do 10 minutes of it. Only 10 minutes. Just enough to get everything going activated. I save all my static stretching, my foam rolling, lacrosse ball. That's after the workout. A lot of people say, well, okay, why don't you do foam rolling? Well, imagine, so if you're, let's say you're foam rolling your IT bands because they're inflamed. Mm -hmm. you, you feel the tightness. If I foam roll, too much there, I can risk inflaming them more. Mm. And my idea, and let's go back to the IT band. So let's say the IT band is tight. Mm. Well, I know your hip is tight. If, you, if you're talking to me as a coach or athlete, I know your hip is tight. If we open up the hip, get the glute to do more work, mm -hmm. that's gonna release the IT band. And you throw an avocado at them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah they, they might need more fat. 
right, right. If they come to the gym, they don't have energy. Oh, <laughs> we got to get some more fat in you. <laughs> Is there anything else that you see that's that's changing? Uh, you're on the cutting cutting edge of yeah. of coaching. Yeah. Uh, in weightlifting right now. You're doing a lot of things other coaches aren't doing. Is there anything else you, you feel that we could be doing better? I mean, we covered a lot. I mean, nutrition, yeah, yeah, movement, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I, I feel like if we're talking about a weightlifting coach and, we, and we're talking about performance, if we really believe in those words, if we really believe in the functional, I would look at everything from the, like the gut health. When you advise your athletes not to take these over-the-counter medicines, allergy medicines, whatever pharmaceutical, med let's, let's keep it natural, functional medicine. Yeah. Let's keep it there because all those have an adverse uh, uh, effect. So we're gonna cut down on the inflammation by not putting those things in our body, by doing it naturally. So if, if, if your athlete is, is constantly getting sick, a flu, because I, I run into that a lot of times. Oh, I had the flu, I was sick. Well, that's not, a, that's not an excuse for me. If that's an excuse for you, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna push the issue. But if you're talking about being the best, training, or just trying to build the best team ever, you don't want athletes getting sick. Yeah. Like if you get sick, it could take up to a week, two weeks to recover from being yeah. sick. And if you constantly come in there and, and train, which most people do when they get a cold, you're only impairing your immune system more. You're, you're only doing more to, to slow down healing. Yeah. So I know people think they can sweat it out. It doesn't, no, no, it doesn't work like that. So, so gut health and really with the, with the focus of uh, keeping the inflammation down from eliminating the chemicals, from how you clean, how you do laundry, like all that. That's what I mean, not just eating, not just from the gut microbiome. You gotta, you gotta be a hippie microbiome. too. You gotta be a full hippie. <laughs> Getting, Sorry, man, I, I stopped, getting, I used to stop getting using, the chemicals out of your deal. Yeah. I stopped using uh, body soap yeah. at all like uh, yeah. three and a half years ago for that reason. Well, you, you, you don't take care of the skin biome, right? Yeah, you, you don't want to, like, even using like soap just so often, which nothing wrong with being, want to be clean, <laughs> yeah. but because I don't want to be just like some, anyway. Kenny uh, stopped wiping in the night. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and I'm 110. Yeah. <laughs> so, so even yeah. something like just, just, Based off, and I'm just trying to get sports performance. Right. And once again, it's spiraled. It's all these little things. Yeah, so yeah. I keep, and I listen to this doctor, I listen to this doctor, I listen to this professional, and I get more, and I get more. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and one in particular, Dr. Chutkin, and I was listening, I, was, I wanted to know more, she's a, a gastrointestinal yeah. doctor, like world class. And then I was listening to her, I was like, oh, this is great stuff. Yeah. Yes, yeah. this is, I can use this. And then she introduced me to the skin, microbiome mm. about soap skip uh, uh, stripping the skin of good bacteria yeah the, the the chemicals the shampoos the conditioners stripping that good bacteria in our head which affects performance yeah yeah, yeah. Derek, man thanks uh, for uh allowing us to come in and hang out with you train today uh, definitely. uh man if i learned anything is if i want to change culture through weightlifting yeah. and make an impact on lives yeah. i should talk to you first <laughs> for sure yeah. Uh, I really like the piece that you, you mentioned about ego. I feel like every time I hear yeah. the word ego, it's someone that's saying like ego is bad or yeah. like, or you should like reduce it, the, it, your ego somebody, or you got to get rid of it. But you, you were taking the fact that you have an ego and that's just a part of life in yeah. a lot of ways and you're utilizing it in the best way possible by, by you know, thinking like I have an ego, I fucking think I'm awesome, I think I'm the best, but at the same time you have a lot of respect for other people. Uh, which I think is a great way to do it. Taking that one step further, I appreciated the same thing that Doug did and just the fact that there's some clarity around what ego can be in a healthy way. And the thing that I learned again from you was that if you put in the work, it's all right to have that ego. Because like Doug says, often we're very judgmental. We're gym owners, people are like, oh, ego, ego, ego is the enemy. And it, can be because it can be self-destructive for people if they let it and if they're not doing the work but if you're doing the work then get at it and that's what you embody so thank you for that d yeah. where can we get find it. out more about you if people want to find you so you can follow me at for derek on instagram on twitter on, and, and on facebook so that's the number four derek d-e-r-i-c-k yeah. Thanks. Thanks and, and if people want to come train at Venice Barbell, yeah. like you guys take take drop-ins if people are in town or if people just live in the area. Absolutely. Come 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 on by. Go to the beach first and go to the beach afterward. There you go. It's only about 
a, a mile away. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so. for joining us. And uh, make sure to go to iTunes, give us a five-star review, positive comment, subscribe there, and subscribe on YouTube because we're always putting up great new videos. Yeah. Boom. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Steve. Cool, dude.